For millennia, the Western Abnaki people have been stewards of this land where we now have the privilege of gathering as a religious community. Let us honor their legacy of love and stewardship. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sarah Franklin, your worship associate for this service. You can see from your order of service that Reverend Joan has taken artificial intelligence, or AI, as her theme for this service. So buckle up. <laughs> we all know that this subject seems poised to transform our world, so we look forward to hearing more. We appreciate those of you who were able to join us here in the sanctuary today, as well as those of you joining us from home. And we are so glad we have the live stream with us. We are glad to have the company and fellowship of all. For over 155 years, this church has been a sanctuary for those seeking spiritual sustenance, as well as advocacy for peace and justice in the wider world. We invite you to continue with us today on that path. Please know that there are hearing assist devices there on the back table for those to whom that would be helpful. It's always a pleasure to have newcomers join us for worship. So if you are a guest or a newcomer, uh, if this is your first or second time visiting, we'd love to have you um, give us a wave or stand and be greeted. Oh, we are so glad you are here. We hope you will join us for coffee hour. Everyone is invited to coffee hour after this service. And uh, today there will be some special festivities going on. You'll hear more about that in a bit. So um, newcomers are welcome to um, join the welcome table there. You can fill out a form. And you will be uh, welcomed more particularly by this congregation. Today, Betty McKinnell is our lay pastoral caregiver. Betty is right there. So if you have some personal concern, challenge, or loss that calls for support and the prayers of our spiritual community, you can look for Betty after the service to share more. <clears throat> Everybody has seen where Betty is. And now let us take a few moments to turn to our neighbors in nearby pews and share a few words of personal greeting. lack for the gift of gab, do we? So you are invited to continue these conversations uh, after the service at the coffee hour. And um, now let's uh, take a deep breath. You can, yes, you can take a deep breath. And I have just one, one more thing to say to you all, all of you. Good morning. So when you arrived, you were handed an order of service, a nice sheet, bios for our new members, and probably a small piece of paper. Um, and on there is an invitation, if you, if you wish to accept it, to share one sentence that you would put into a sermon about interdependence. There are writing implements at the end of the pews you might need to share. 
Um, so I just wanted to point that out and what that is. These papers will be collected later in the service. Um, and it's totally optional. So if you prefer not to participate, that is completely fine. And I will also be giving you all um, a few more quiet, dedicated moments to focus on this task later on in our service, um, if you wish to just be completely focused as we enter more deeply into our time of worship with our prelude. Drawn by the intricate web of existence that binds us all together, by the cries and the creaks made by our human bodies, we gather together in community. Here we are reminded that we are all connected in profound and mysterious ways. Here we come to grasp that our lives are intertwined, friends and strangers, elders and the young, wealthy and poor, joyful and heartbroken. Recognizing and honoring our interdependence, we join in this sacred time and space. Let us do so with reverence and gratitude. And let us join our voices now in our opening hymn. It's number 128 in the gray hymnal, For All That Is Our Life. Please rise in body or spirit.
And now I'd like to invite Elaine Ball to help me light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. Thank you, Elaine. If those of you at home have one available, we invite you to light a chalice with us. We light this flame, enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. Thank you. Before we move on, I'd like to add a chalice reading from that passionate old romantic poet, William Wordsworth. These lines come from his famous poem, Tintern Abbey. And if you're interested, you can found, find uh, this passage as reading number 499 in your gray hymnal. Or you can just listen. Here, Wordsworth celebrates the profound and essential connection between human thought and human feeling, a connection that it seems we are going to be forced to explore anew as we move into the world of AI. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thought, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky. And in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. During this morning's service, we honor the newest members of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier in their decision to formalize their commitment to this community by joining our congregation. As Unitarian Universalists, we come together with the understanding that being in community together is more important than dogma or creed. And thus, the relationships that we build in our congregations and the trust and dialogue that come in those relationships are essential to our faith. Freely entering into the bond of membership is one way of deepening your relationship to this religious community. While anyone, member or friend, can participate actively in the life of this community, those who become members are choosing to make a special commitment to be active and engaged participants and decision makers of the congregation, to be in covenantal relationship with other members of the church, and to affirm their sense of belonging in a more formal way. Anyone who is 14 years old or older and is committed to our mission can join the church as a member. And at any point, if you're interested in learning more about membership, you can contact me or Elaine Ball, our Congregational Life Coordinator. And Elaine will now introduce the new members being recognized this morning. Good morning. My name is Elaine Ball. My pronouns are she and they. And it's my pleasure to welcome our new members today. We are so glad that you have found a spiritual home here at the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, a place to be nurtured, to grow, to learn, to minister to others as you are ministered to and, to, and a place to collaborate with others to make our world a better place for everyone. Our new members joining our congregation this spring are Scotty Brower, Lotus, Amy Handy, Leopard, and Elsie Murphy. In our new member ceremony today, we're going to recognize <clears throat> we're going to recognize Lotus and Scotty and Leopard and Elsie. And you can find bios and photos for a few of our new members with your orders of service 
And in the coming weeks, we'll have bios and photos for all of them at the membership and hospitality table. We hope in the coming weeks that you will seek out our new members, learn their faces, and introduce yourself, welcome them, and congratulate them for taking this step to be a voted, a committed and voting member of our UCM community. Would you please rise to be recognized? <laughs> We're going to introduce, thank you. We're going to introduce each of our new members to come up, um, up front. If you want to step over here, I'll introduce each of you. Um, some of them have already signed the book and others will be signing our membership book, which I'll also bring downstairs if you'd like to take a look. It's a very historic, beautiful book with people's names. You can try to find yours and remember when you joined. Um, I'll have that down at the table in the vestry. As Reverend Joan mentioned, we welcome all who are 14 years or older to learn more about Unitarian Universalism and our UCM community, and to sign the membership book as a demonstration that they're committed to a continued and active participation in the life and democratic governance of UCM. All right, so um, Nancy and Brenda are going to Come forward to give some gifts to our new member, new members, and I'll start with Leopard. Go ahead and come up. Um, Leopard has already signed the membership book and is an incredibly talented writer, as you will learn later in our service, um, and an activist for social and intellectual accessibility and disability rights. If you'd like to learn more, please, um, please contact. Leopard later. <laughs> and Elsie, Elsie Murphy, grew up in Massachusetts. She moved here two years ago to be closer to her sons and grandchildren. She was a middle school teacher for 25 years, and she says she feels at home here at UCM because of the sense of community and the way that everyone reaches out to help others. Scotty Brower is excited to return after a hiatus of 35 years. She's also a retired teacher um, and loves spending time with her grandson, yoga and Pilates, reading and deep conversations on walks with friends. And finally, Lotus, pronouns fleur, fleur self, a, air, and she, they. Lotus is a musician, as we'll also hear later in the service today, and a pagan and activist hailing from Burlington originally and now living in Montpelier. The gifts that they're being given are a carnation and a membership certificate with the date that they joined, signed by Reverend Joan, and <laughs> also an introductory book. They've already been introduced to Unitarian Universalism, but this is a collection of essays and readings and writings and songs um, that are well known in UU congregations. <laughs> Leopard, Elsie, Scotty, and Lotus. You have now signed our membership book, but joining UCM is much more than simply signing your name in the book. It means being a part of this gathered community and taking part in its shared ministry. It means speaking up about the future of our congregation, offering and receiving spiritual gifts, supporting others, and being supported in return. If you will join in this mission and this work, please say, I will. I will. And now I invite the congregation to join in welcoming you as new members of this community and committing themselves to be in covenant with you. We will join together in a responsive litany of membership that includes our congregational covenant. And there are parts for the congregation, for our new members, and for all of us to speak together. And you can see those words um, projected up front. And so we start with the congregation. We welcome you with joy. 
into the sacred bonds of membership. We welcome you with love into the life of this community. We promise to be with you in times of joy and sorrow. We honor your search for truth and meaning. We will walk with you as together we seek the truth in love, as we serve one another and our wider human community and planet. With joy we enter into the sacred bonds of membership. With love we bring our whole selves to the life of this congregation. We promise to walk beside you in times of joy and sadhguru. And in turn, asking you to walk beside us as seekers of truth and unity, we commit ourselves to the living tradition of which we are all a part. As members of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, we covenant to speak honestly and listen deeply to each other and the voice within. Treat each other with compassion and honor our differences. Take responsibility for the impact our words, actions, and inactions have on each other. Support each other in times of need and of grief, and celebrate the beauty and joy in our lives. Honor the gifts of the past and be gentle with each other as we grow. It is with great joy that we welcome these newest members to the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. Please join in making a joyful noise for them. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. You can read. So before we sing our children out, I want to share that today the middle school group will meet in the children's chapel with Susan Koch and Andrea Tucker from about 11.30 to 1 o'clock. All middle school children and youth are invited. And now I invite all of the children who are present to join their leaders and friends in the green rug in the children's chapel. Classes end about 10 minutes after the hour or so, and parents may pick up your children at that time. Earlier, I offered the invitation to share one sentence that you would put into a sermon on interdependence, and if you would like to do so, uh, we're just going to take a few moments, quiet moments now, if you want to gather your thoughts and write something down. Again, this is totally optional. A selection of these will be read later, aloud, later in the service. Um, so you can take a moment, a few quiet moments, and then uh, we'll have 
a volunteer who is yet to be identified come up and collect these from you in just a few moments. And as you finish, you can pass your papers down to the center aisle, as you usually do during our offering time. And I might just ask someone who is seated close to the back table, who wouldn't mind doing so, thank you, Bryce, to just grab, there's a basket on the back table, a sort of round basket, and if you would just come up front and collect those as we transition into our announcements, and um, you can deliver those to me up here on the chancel. Thank you. Exciting things going on today, right? <laughs> Uh, one of the other exciting things that's going on is we are preparing for Poetry Sunday, which is going to come up next. And so it's rather short notice, but luckily here in this congregation, we have many poets. So we are asking you to look in the announcements and you'll see that the call for poems is going forth. We need them by five o'clock on Tuesday. So uh, fortunately, lots of us have poets, poems ready to hand. We do need original poems. So um, that's, and you're going to send them to me, and I'm going to get them to Jen. We're going to sequence them and make a whole uh, service out of people's poems. So I'm looking forward to that process, and I hope many of you will reach into your archives and find what you have available that you'd most like to share with us. Thank you. So um, I think that I need to say a few words about our celebration coming up right after uh, this service. So when we get to the coffee hour today, we're going to find that there are all sorts of gifts of love that we can bid for. And there's a whole process um, that is set up and ready for us to participate in when we arrive at coffee hour. So. Um, if you had a chance last week to explore some of the gifts of love that are available, you may know already what you want to bid on, but everybody has um, coupons that they can use to do the bidding, and uh, winning tickets will be drawn today. So, so far we have raised $600 toward our goal of $5,000. And we are accepting donations um, from the congregation today. So um, be ready to participate in that process once you get to coffee hour, please. All right. And I think Reverend Joan would like to say a word or two about our Grandmother's Hands a group, which is assembling now. Thank you, Sarah. Members of the Racial Justice Group are organizing a nine-week study group based on the book, My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. That will begin in early May. The group will be facilitated by a local practitioner with the Everything Space. And the study group is part of our congregation's ongoing efforts to live into the eighth principle, which we adopted as a congregation in February of 2022. 
So I encourage you to learn more about this opportunity to grow and learn with others on the journey of building a diverse, multicultural, beloved community. There are details in the e-news. Generosity is a spiritual practice central to the well-being of our church. With our collective resources, our free church gratefully supports the shared values of this congregation. Each month, our UCM Community Pouch Program shares our collection with a church or community organization aligned with our values. This month's community pouch recipient is our own UCM community lunch. Half our cash offerings go to our pouch recipient, while the other half directly support our congregational ministry. If you wish to designate your entire offering to the community pouch, please indicate that with a note attached to your cash or in the memo line of your check. Checks go to the church unless designated otherwise. The green velvet offering pouches can be found at the left end of each pew with the hymnals. We are grateful for every gift, whether made in person, mailed, sent from your bank, or automatically charged to a credit card. One by one, each of your offerings helps us to build a better world. And your offering will now be gratefully received. You may have noticed in your order of service that our musical offering today is based on a poem written by our new member, Leopard. And Leopard will be reciting their poem for us um, before we sing their words set to music. Leopard, will you come forward? Thank you, Reverend. I signed my name in the book today, but I didn't sign my life away. I gained a community to guide, nourish, and support me, to embrace me no matter how far afield, no matter what view I see, excuse me, so I in turn can learn how to pass on the hospitality. Seasons come and seasons go but the church will always know how to welcome me home, to tell me I am loved and wanted, no matter how far afield I might have roamed. 16 years, I have searched for something free of dogma or philosophy. I've been aching, despairing, hopeless, frankly, just a mess. But the, then the arms of the UAA found me. Seasons come and seasons go, but the church will always know how to welcome me home to tell me I am loved and wanted, no matter how far afield I have roamed. I am loved, I am finally home. My heart and soul no longer have to roam. Seasons come and seasons go, but the church will always know how to welcome me home, to tell me I am loved and wanted, no matter how far afield I have roamed. Thank you.
Let us join now in a time of meditation and prayer. I hear you doing it already, and so I'll invite you to just settle in where you are, allowing your body to feel its weight against the seat, allowing yourself to feel the solidness of the ground beneath you. Noticing and offering compassion for how you are in this moment. And I invite you to pray with me in whatever manner of prayer or reflection is most meaningful to you. Spirit of life, Mother of all, mystery beyond our understanding, here we are, living, breathing creatures with minds that wonder and hearts that feel awe. We face questions that we know can't be answered and tragedies that we know can't be explained. May we find patience in all that is unanswered and peace in all that will never be explained. Here we are living, breathing creatures with open minds and tender hearts. May we hold ourselves with gentleness for all that brings us worry and all that makes our hearts break. May the living, breathing creatures that we are feel the breath of life moving in us, and through all things, bringing us into greater union with the mysterious universe of which we are a part. Blessed be and amen. 
And let us now join in a time of quiet meditation together. Our reading this morning comes from you, an extemporaneous homily on interdependence. (laughs) We need each other even when we don't realize it. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and by this we live. That's in the hymnal. You gotta, you gotta attribute your sources, you know? <laughs> A web of life, strong and flexible. Let's remember that we are all in this together. We are all connected with each other and with the nature around us. Be kind to both. We are on a seesaw, balancing ourselves and each other. Interdependence is what allows us humans to find joy, connection, and support. As an elder facing the loss of a partner, I hope that interdependence is a strong fabric. What would the world be like if we had solid interdependence, and how do we get there? One heartbeat, one earth, one breath. Human, coyote, porcupine, tadpole, maple tree, moss. As a child growing up in Baku, Azerbaijan, Gary Kasparov loved to play chess. He not only loved it, he was good at it. By the age of seven, he was recognized as a chess prodigy. He started competing in chess tournaments at a young age, and in 1985, at the age of 22, he became the youngest ever world chess champion. Kasparov's rise as a chess player paralleled the rise of artificial intelligence and chess playing computers in particular. 
A little more than a decade after becoming the then youngest world chess champion, Kasparov sat, sat down for a match against a chess-playing supercomputer super dubbed Deep Blue. In the first match, Kasparov outwitted Deep Blue, switching strategies mid-game, and was victorious. Score one for the human. They played again the following year in 1997, and this time, Kasparov's wait-and-see approach did not work in his favor. In just one hour, Deep Blue had captured Kasparov's queen, and Kasparov conceded defeat, thus ending the match, resulting in the first time a computer defeated a reigning world chess champion under tournament conditions. Score one for AI. Many advancements in artificial intelligence have taken place in the decades since that matchup. Today, we find ourselves swimming in new waters where AI's capabilities have begun to outpace our human capacity to clearly apply moral and ethical frameworks to this technology or even to fully understand what it is we are creating. If you're not familiar with what artificial intelligence is, let me give a simple definition. Artificial intelligence is the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computers. The cognitive functions that AI is designed to simulate include learning, reasoning, self-correction, and creativity. There are many types of AI and ways that it is being applied today in our everyday life and in very specialized settings. There are chat bots that show up on websites asking if you need assistance, how can I help you today? Or computerized customer service agents that you might sometimes speak to when you're trying to sort out a cable bill or change a flight reservation. There are assistive, assistive devices you can talk to at home that will respond when you ask it to play your favorite song or turn on the news. At an appointment with my primary care provider recently, she asked if I would be okay with her testing out a new AI program designed to listen in and take notes on the patient's chart after the appointment so that the provider could be more focused with their patient. And after asking some questions about privacy, I did consent. A less benevolent use of AI is the malware bot used to infiltrate user accounts and steal personal information. These are so ubiquitous on the internet that we often have to check that little box at the bottom of an online form to confirm that you're not a robot. I can stand here today and confidently tell you without identifying any traffic lights or bicycles <laughs> that I am not a robot. <laughs> Score one for Joan. So some of my colleagues recently had a discussion about the merits and ethical challenges of utilizing AI for assistance with sermon preparation. In particular, they were discussing the use of ChatGPT, which is a tool that draws upon an incredibly large amount of data to respond to written tasks that you give it in a conversational manner. One person shared how it felt like cheating to ask ChatGPT to present a simplified explanation for a complex concept that they wanted to include in their sermon. Another person shared how helpful it has been to have a tool that can assist in organizing their thoughts given certain learning disabilities that they have. I don't have a single decisive conclusion about this yet, and I'm not sure I ever will. But I am fascinated by the ways that we are experimenting with these tools, especially to amplify and support how we communicate with one another. So we're gonna do an experiment together now. I read some of your responses earlier to the question of what you would put into a sermon about interdependence, our worship theme for the month of April. And you truly said some beautiful and profound things. I can't wait to read through all of them. But let's see what ChatGPT would say. <laughs> One moment. Uh -huh. 
So ChatGPT is asking, how can I help you today? We're going to tell ChatGPT, write a Unitarian Universalist sermon about interdependence. I haven't, I, I really haven't done this yet. Okay, I'm going to read you some of this. I won't read all of it. This is quite extensive. I, I think there must be a lot of data on this one. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit of it for you. Dear beloved community, today let us explore a profound concept that lies at the very core of our Unitarian Universalist faith, interdependence. As we gather in the spirit of love and inquiry, let us reflect on the interconnectedness that binds us all together, weaving the tapestry of existence in a delicate dance of reciprocity and mutual support. In a world that often celebrates individualism and self-sufficiency, it is easy to forget that we are all deeply interconnected beings, intertwined in a web of relationships that extends far beyond ourselves. Interdependence is not merely a philosophical idea. It is a fundamental truth of our existence, echoing through the cosmos in every breath we take and every action we make. So I, I'm not actually going to read it all, but you could try that at home for yourself. <laughs> I'm going to make that go away so it's not distracting you all. <laughs> so you might be wondering whether any of this sermon that I am delivering to you this morning <laughs> was written by AI. And except for what I just read off the OpenAI website, my sermon today has been produced using my own natural intelligence alone, though I have certainly consulted many resources through books and articles and conversations with other people, as well as my own life experiences to compose what I am presenting to you right now. Artificial intelligence, however, has contributed to this service by way of a few of the phrases incorporated into my opening words which were generated when asking ChatGPT to write an opening for a Unitarian Universalist service on the theme of interdependence. And you might have noticed the image in your order of service. It's on the front, uh, on the first page near the description. It's a multicolored rectangle with shades of blue and orange in the background and lines, smaller squares and rectangles creating a pattern, kind of like a neural network. This image was created by Generative AI when I gave it the description for this worship service as a prompt. Now I realize much of this might be new to some of you. A lot of it is new to me, actually. So let me just give you a few moments to let this information settle in. I invite you to notice your response to what I've shared so far. Is it curiosity, excitement, worry, maybe just confusion? I think many of us realize that this moment we are in could be a major turning point. And at the same time, we're not sure where that turning point is leading. As a preacher and pastor, what I am interested in, even more so than the technology itself, is our human response to it. What do we make of this moment that we're living in? How will we use the technological powers we are in the midst of creating? How does artificial intelligence change our relationships and interdependence with one another, human to human, as well as our dependence on technology? Samuel Wells, the editor of the Christian Century, says that human responses to AI could be categorized into three different groups. Not on your life, <laughs> yes, please, and yes, but. And what he describes tracks pretty well with what I've observed within my own circles, and particularly the first and the last grouping. The not on your life people imagine artificial intelligence reaching a point 
of development where it has the ability to reproduce itself and inevitably dominates human civilization. A few weeks ago, a young person in our congregation shared the concern during our candlelighting time that AI ro robots could take over the world. And there were a few chuckles when he said this, just like right now. However, this is a very real and felt concern that many people hold. On the other end of the spectrum of responses are the yes please people. The story for the yes please crowd is that humans will be able to utilize artificial intelligence to overcome all limitations. AI is an extension of human mastery over our, our entire material existence and beyond. And then perhaps somewhere in the middle, there is the yes but response. This perspective is not fundamentally opposed to or in favor of artificial intelligence. However, one important piece of the story from this perspective is how all new technologies tend to amplify power differentials and inequities that are already present in the world, and therefore, we ought to be cautious. And I'm certain there are responses that fit in and around all three of these. One of the strongest pushbacks against AI has been coming from the world of journalism. Several news organizations have recently filed lawsuits against OpenAI, claiming the tech company had used their copyrighted material to train ChatGPT without seeking permission or offering compensation. Most higher education institutions have now developed policies on the appropriate use of generative AI as instructors, instructors grapple with how to evaluate students' work and students grapple with the veracity of the information they're finding using these tools. At the heart of these criticisms and concerns is the question of what is real? Is there any authenticity to words, images, or music that is generated by human programmed artificial intelligence? The creative and generative power we humans possess is surely one of our finest gifts. That we can create poetry and music and art and design planes and build engines is a miracle of life. That we can then share these things with others and foster connections and relationships among us is another miracle of life. Our grappling with the value and pitfalls of artificial intelligence brings us closer to the question of what really makes us human. And what about being human is irreplaceable? While the technology we develop can do some cool things and maybe even make life easier in some regards, there is also so much that we experience that is fulfilling and enlivening as we live it through our brains and our bodies just as they are. Rhonda Fabian, editor of Cosmos Quarterly, writes, here's what AI does not know. The transformational experience of beauty, the felt thrill of creativity, languages of the wind, the voluptuousness of the sea, the treeing of trees, the being of bees, the gesture of the giraffe, the voice of the beloved, scent of the lilac, lift of the seabird, laughter of women working, smell of snow, a lover's caress, the teeming soil, moonlight's mystery, the pain of labor and joy of birth, shamanic vision, insight, love, freedom itself. What a thing to be able to be in this world that offers us beauty, joy, pain, and love in every moment, in every place, in this very body. And what a thing to be in a world where we also express our ingenuity, creativity, and innovation in continuously sophisticated ways 
that stretch our understanding of what it means to be in this moment, in this place, and in this body. We humans have many powerful capabilities to create and to destroy, to love and to hate, to help and to harm. I believe our greatest power is one we encounter in this sanctuary every week. The human power and intelligence of forming, nurturing, and restoring relationships in a community of interdependence and mutuality. Whatever may lie ahead, however we continue to tinker and invent and reach beyond the boundaries of even our own mental capacities, may we know real love, real care, and real wonder. May we know what is truly at the heart of life and give thanks. So may it be. Please rise, embody your spirit. Let's join in singing our closing hymn. It's number 331 in the gray hymnal. Life is the greatest gift of all. As we close our service, we extinguish our chalice and carry with us its flame of truth, the warmth of community, and the spark of hope into the days and the week ahead. Will you extinguish? And as we do so, let us say together our mission statement. We, we welcome, welcome all as, as we, we build, build a loving community, community to, to nurture each person's spiritual journey, journey serve, serve human, human need, need and protect the earth, our home. And these closing words are by George Brooks. May the love that gives to life its beauty, the reverence that gives to life its sacredness, and the purpose that gives to life its deep significance be strong within each of us and lead us into ever deepening relationships with all of life. And we conclude our service with the postlude played today by Lotus. <laughs>